Rick descended from the second floor into the spacious kitchen and switched on the old yet functional kettle. Many of his acquaintances found this habit amusing. Considering his successful business, he could easily afford a new kettle, or even hire someone to serve him tea in bed. But what could they understand? Rick would never dispose of this old kettle, nor let anyone else touch it. After all, it was a gift from his fiancée, a strange but heartfelt present that she occasionally gave him. Feeling exhausted, he rubbed his temples. Despite just waking up, he felt as if he had been standing all day. Unwanted memories flooded his mind. They were painful and he wanted to push them away, but they were all he had left. He held on to them like a drowning man clutching at straws. But why do I need a new kettle? He asked grumpily back then. The old one still works. If anything happens, I'll buy a new one myself. Carly, you don't need to give me anything. Your old one doesn't work very well, it seems to me, she replied with a laugh. Besides, this one looks much prettier. And about gifts. Of course, I don't have to, but I want to. This was always the case. She gave him somewhat practical items, leaving him to wonder why. Was she embarrassed by the income disparity? Or did she not want to appear materialistic? However, Rick would never entertain such thoughts, as he clearly saw Carly's genuine love for him. Powerful and sincere, just as he loved her. He also gave her gifts, primarily expensive jewellery. Carly accepted them with sincere delight, but she rarely wore them, perhaps only when she met him, and not every time. This puzzled Rick, but he didn't know how to handle it. Should he give her something different? But what? One day he asked her directly, Carly, I get the feeling you're not happy with what I give. Maybe you want something else? Why are you dissatisfied? She replied, They're very nice. Then why do you wear them so infrequently? I'm not sure, Carly said, wrinkling her nose. I guess I'm just not used to them. You'll have to get used to it, Rick said with a smile. However, apart from these small misunderstandings, their relationship was going just fine. They understood each other from half a word, and it was not just a beautiful expression, but their objective reality. At times, a single glance was all they needed to comprehend each other's thoughts. This level of understanding started from their first meeting. Carly stood at the station, pale and bewildered. People bustled around her, wrapped up in their own worlds. They passed by the forlorn girl, not out of indifference, but because she was not in the habit of expressing her emotions. Rick was in a foul mood that day. He had been conducting important negotiations outside the city, and was on his way back when his car broke down unexpectedly. He called a repair crew, but he didn't have the opportunity to wait for them, let alone for them to fix everything. His next meeting was scheduled to start in just over an hour. He tried to hail a cab, but to no avail. There were no available cars nearby. Rick called several other companies, but the result was always the same. Either there were no cars nearby, or all the drivers were booked for the next few hours. He couldn't understand this sudden rush. It was the middle of the workday, a time when cab drivers usually lacked customers. Nevertheless, he needed to find a solution quickly. Upon reflection, he realised he had only one option. To take public transportation, specifically the fastest train. With a heavy sigh, he left his car for servicing and headed towards the nearest train station. His luck continued as not all trains stopped at this station, but one was due in five minutes. If he had spent more time with his car, he would have missed it, with the next train only due in three hours. Rick walked up the platform and began to pace impatiently. He could already see his train in the distance. It looked tiny, like a toy, but with each moment it grew larger and more substantial. The loud horn, a signal of its impending arrival, was already audible. And then... Rick momentarily glanced away from the train, his heart seeming to stutter and then race. He was certain 
He had never seen such a beautiful, yet sad girl. Almost unconsciously, he approached her. What's wrong? What makes you say that? She lifted her gaze to meet his. There were no tears, but her eyes held a profound sadness, even despair, as if she wanted to ask for help but didn't dare. In an unexpected impulse, Rick took her hand. She didn't pull away, yet she didn't respond. Her hand hung limply in his. I can tell by your eyes, he said, and your posture. I'm sorry, but you seem troubled. May I help you? Unless you possess the art of teleportation, she replied sadly. Alas, I don't. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. He sighed with a smile. But perhaps there are more realistic ways to solve the problem? Tell me, and we'll think together about what can be done. What's there to do? she asked, waving her hands confused. I mistakenly left my train pass at home, and the next train isn't for another three hours. I can't retrieve it from home and be on time on that train. If I'm late for work, I'll be fired. The pass was in my wallet, so I can't even buy a single ticket. The girl looked at him, perplexed and possibly judgmental. She likely saw this as a serious problem, and did not expect laughter in response to her predicament, especially from the person who had just offered to help. Ignoring her gaze, Rick swiftly left his seat and headed towards the ticket office. As he approached, he realized he didn't know her destination station. However, he didn't consider it a major issue. Handing the cashier a few bills, he bought a ticket to the final station. With this ticket, his new acquaintance could disembark at any stop. Rick returned to the platform just as the train arrived. A girl was waiting for him, nervously shifting from foot to foot. Rick smiled and handed her a ticket. She glanced at him and laughed, more from relief than anything else. Look, she said as the doors closed behind them. This is very inconvenient. I don't see any inconvenience, Rick replied. By the way, my name is Rick. What's yours? Carly, she replied, sounding somewhat robotic. Listen, Rick, give me your phone number. I'll pay you back for the ticket. That's a clever excuse to get my number, he chuckled. That's a first for me. Usually, I'm the one who needs incentive to get a girl's phone number. And how many of these numbers do you have? Or do you sell them right away? Carly joked. Rick looked at her in confusion before understanding her joke and laughing heartily. Any remaining tension between them immediately dissipated. The rest of the way they chatted merrily about everything in the world. However, as it turned out, Carly got off after only a few stations. She insisted on exchanging their number to pay him back for the ticket. He, in turn, gave her a few more bills as a farewell, having first realised that Carly would have no money left for the return trip. Thus, they found a reason to meet again. The businessman was running late for his meeting, but no longer viewed it as a tragedy, as he had a few hours ago. His partners understood the situation and agreed to reschedule the negotiations for the next day. After all, everyone has a car breakdown at the most inconvenient time. But that wasn't Rick's main concern. Rick's mind was preoccupied with his new acquaintance. He could easily visualize her delicate facial features slender hands and bright smile. Her laughter, jokes and unique phrases echoed in his mind. He was grateful that the meeting fell through, as he was incapable of focusing on business that day. Rick and Carly met again a week later, but purely by chance. He had considered calling her multiple times, but hesitated, fearing his feelings may not be mutual, despite their initial connection. The day of their second meeting was particularly stressful for Rick. He had been busy since the early morning, without a break until 9pm. He hadn't had time to eat, so he decided to stop at a cafe. Exhausted, he chose the nearest fast food restaurant, despite it not being his usual preference. At that moment, he didn't care. Selecting a few appetizing dishes, Rick found an empty corner table and began eating. 
Soon, he heard a familiar voice. Would you mind if I joined you? Surprised, Rick looked up to see Carly beside his table, holding a tray and smiling. He stood, took her tray, placed it on the table, and pulled out a chair for her. She sat. I never expected to see you here, Carly stated. It must be fate, Rick responded, grinning. I don't frequent trains, and I don't frequent eating in such places. What brings you? I thought city trips weren't your thing. You're right, she agreed, but work sometimes demands it. In that case, I'm glad your work brought you here today. Me too, Carly replied softly and shyly. It probably could have lasted longer, but an irritated restaurant employee informed them that the establishment was closing soon. Only then, Carly realized that she was about to miss the last train. Rick accompanied her to the station. Call me this time, the girl shouted, just before the train doors slammed shut. By all means, Rick responded quietly. Although Carly couldn't see him, she didn't need to. She read his response not just from his lips, but from his eyes, and smiled. As the train sped away, Rick walked along the carriage, waving to Carly, who waved back. Perhaps in that moment, they both understood they had become a real couple, with many months of unspoiled happiness ahead. The whistling kettle snapped Rick out of his fond memories and back into a harsh reality where Carly no longer existed. With a heavy sigh, he made some tea and retreated to his room with his mug. He had woken up too late for a full breakfast. Sipping the scorching drink, Rick prepared for another meeting. The key was not to forget anything. Documents, money, cell phone. Dressing appropriately was crucial. Of late, he had become forgetful, often leaving behind his tie or shirt. After confirming he had everything, Rick grabbed his keys off the hook and left his apartment. While passing his mailbox, he spotted something inside. Although surprised, he decided to check the contents later that evening. The mystery of the unexpected letter consumed him throughout the day. He was used to electronic mail, his mailbox usually filled with unimportant junk. However, the envelope he saw that morning appeared to be a proper paper letter, leaving him curious about the sender. That day, Rick struggled to focus on his work. His usual concerns about partner meetings, routine tasks, and business development strategies were overshadowed by thoughts about the mysterious envelope. When he returned home, Rick headed straight for the mailbox. Upon opening the drawer with a key, Rick was surprised and somewhat fearful to see his hands trembling. After finally managing to unlock it, he pulled out a thick white envelope. He was utterly stunned to see the signature. To favorite tiger, from a panda. How could this be? He spent a few seconds staring at the inscription, unable to look away. Had he ever seen Carly's handwriting, it might have been easier for him. However, they had only corresponded via text messages. What was clear to him was that only she could know the pet names they used for each other. Somewhat recovering from the shock, Rick, ignoring any pretense of composure, rushed to the room where the concierge sat. The elderly woman looked at him with mild confusion. He showed her the envelope and, gasping for breath, asked, Did you happen to see exactly who brought it? I suppose it was the letter carrier, the woman responded indifferently. It can't be. There are no stamps, not even an address. But how should I know? The concierge replied with a hint of irritation in her voice. And aren't you here? Rick burst out. To know who and why someone enters the building. Do you think I'm not human or something? The indignant woman retorted. Am I not allowed to eat or use the restroom? If someone entered the building, they must have had the keys or knew the code. It must be theirs. Don't get so excited. With security like this, strangers could have done whatever they wanted. Rick snorted and left, having the last word. As he rode the elevator, he felt resentment. This feeling overwhelmed him so much that he temporarily forgot about the envelope. The building was supposed to be elite, with two-story apartments, 
but instead of professional security guards, there was a bored retiree who was neglecting her duties. But this feeling of resentment only lasted until his eyes fell on the inscription again. His heart yearned, wishing to believe that it was indeed written by Carly, though his mind protested that it was impossible. Rick couldn't find any other hints, no matter how meticulously he examined the envelope. He was too terrified to open it. He vividly recalled the day he came back from an extended business trip overseas. Rick was thrilled, eager to share his happiness with Carly. The deal that prompted his trip had been successful, better than he had anticipated. His months away from home were not in vain. However, his only desire at that moment was to see his girlfriend as soon as possible. No, his fiance, to be accurate. He had proposed to her just before he left, and their wedding was to occur soon after his return. Without even stopping by his apartment for a change and a shower, he headed straight to the village where Carly lived. Rick knocked on her door for a while, but received no answer, which surprised him. Usually at this time Carly would be home. However, he didn't see any reason to be concerned. Perhaps she had gone to the store or was occupied elsewhere. Regretfully, he took out his cell phone because he had hoped to surprise her by showing up unannounced. He called Carly, but her phone was unreachable. This was alarming now. As far as Rick knew, she never turned her phone off and always monitored the battery level just in case. She wouldn't want to be unavailable if something happened to her or her loved ones. Growing more worried, Rick knocked on the door again, this time more forcefully. Still no one answered, and he could hear no movement within the house. On a whim, he tried the doorknob. It was locked. At this moment, an irritated voice rang out. Well, why are you barging in? No one's there. Rick turned to find an elderly woman watching him from the road. Judging by the large bag she carried, she was returning from the store and had been observing his unsuccessful attempts to enter Carly's house for a while. Carly's gone out, hasn't she? Do you know when she'll be back? Rick asked. The woman's face darkened. Don't you know anything? She queried with a sympathetic tone. What should I know? She's dead, the woman replied. She caught pneumonia. She thought it was just a cold and tried treating it with tea and raspberries. By the time she realized it was serious, it was too late. There was nothing doctors could do. But I... I spoke to her on the phone just the day before yesterday. She was coughing, but she said it wasn't serious. Just two days ago, she thought it was nothing serious, but it happened last night. Is someone arranging the funeral, or... Rick trailed off, unsure how to finish his sentence. He was struggling to grasp the reality of the situation. Young people don't just die suddenly like this. It can't be. He thought perhaps the elderly woman was mistaken. Carly must be alive and well. Maybe she had just gone somewhere. As far as I know, Carly is an orphan. So ask her friend Natalie. She lives two houses down, in the one with the red roof, the woman explained. Rick sank to the ground, overwhelmed. Everything started to make sense. Carly was indeed an orphan, and had only one friend from her time in the orphanage, who lived in that very house. There were too many coincidences to keep believing that the old woman was confused. Hey, don't die here yourself. There's no help around here, the elderly woman fretted. No, no, I'm all right. Rick mumbled weakly. Ah, uh, I see the kind of all right you are. What was our Carly to you? A girlfriend? She was my fiancée, replied Rick, vaguely conscious of his words. I left for two months for work, and we were meant to marry on my return. I just came back and went straight to her. I wanted to surprise her. Then Rick slowly got up from the ground, and without dusting his expensive suit, he marched towards the friend's house. He needed to uncover the truth. Part of him still harboured hope that this was a massive misunderstanding, 
and Carly was alive and well. This time, his knock was promptly answered. Natalie, Carly's friend from the orphanage, stood at the door. She scrutinised Rick and asked with a touch of accusation, So, you finally arrived. Where were you when Carly needed help? Rick crinkled his nose. He had never favoured this woman, and didn't comprehend what Carly found in her. Nevertheless, the two were inseparable, and of course, he never dictated who his fiancée could and couldn't be friends with. Is it true? he asked. Secretly, Rick was hoping she would say, of course not. He wanted her to tell him that Carly was actually okay, and that she was now in a hospital, under the care of specialists recovering. Yes, Natalie said. Carly is really dead. I... God! Tears welled up in Rick's eyes involuntarily. Can I do something to help? With the funeral? Or... or... No, Natalie interrupted, slamming the door in his face. She was firm in her decision. Rick was not allowed to help with the funeral arrangements, not even financially. As a result, Carly was buried in the cheapest and most unsightly coffin. The ceremony, in the man's opinion, turned out to be too modest and somewhat stilted, obviously unworthy of the memory of his late bride, but he was unable to influence it. About what happened next, Rick preferred not to remember at all. He plunged into the abyss of despair, unbearable pain, and, like many other unfortunate people, tried to find relief from suffering in alcohol. He drank terribly, almost uncontrollably, completely neglected the business, and seriously thought about leaving this world. But, as luck would have it, he quickly realised that none of this would give him the desired relief, and certainly will not return his beloved. Rick then tried to pull himself together, attempting to gradually escape from his nightmare. This was incredibly difficult, but he succeeded. He used almost all of his remaining money to rehabilitate in a special clinic, and since then, he had abstained from alcohol. Instead, he immersed himself in his work. He needed to revive his business, which he had almost lost due to his own folly. Fortunately, the knowledge and skills he had gained over the years through hard work were not so easily lost. Soon, his financial situation improved, perhaps even surpassing its previous state. However, this did not bring him happiness. His heart was no longer gripped by intense pain. Instead, a quiet, restrained longing had taken its place, constantly lingering. Now, he held a letter in his hands that could have only been written by her, his late beloved. No one else but the two of them knew the affectionate nicknames they used to call each other. This made him incredibly afraid to open the envelope. But deciding not to prolong the anticipation, Rick nervously opened the envelope. He was immediately hit with a wave of dizziness. The faint scent of perfume, Carly's perfume. Of course, this wasn't conclusive evidence. Many people would know her preferred scent, yet he was unshakable in his belief. The fragrance further convinced him that the letter was from his fiancée. He pulled out the neatly folded sheet of paper and scanned it quickly. Then he read it again more slowly and with focus. And again. And again. He must have read the letter at least fifteen times before he understood that he wasn't going to spend the rest of his life standing in the hallway, still in his coat, reading the same lines over and over. He knew it was all nonsense and could not be true. But the letter was written so sincerely, with such love and in recognisable Carly's style, as if she really had written these lines with her own hand. Rick was utterly convinced that nobody except her could have written it like that. Furthermore, substantial evidence pointed towards Carly being the only one who had sent him the letter. Beyond the signature on the envelope, the letter contained many details that only the two of them would know. It mentioned topics about their private midnight philosophical conversations, 
places significant to their relationship, and detailed descriptions of memorable dates. Interestingly, the sender of the letter did not claim that Carly was still alive. In fact, the text openly mentioned her absence from this world. Yet, the sender, whoever it was, expressed a profound yearning for her fiancé and acknowledged the insurmountable barrier separating them. According to the letter, Carly found a way to communicate despite her predicament. Allegedly, she was able to reach out through a psychic, someone highly sensitive to such matters, and transmit her message. She also said that he could respond in the same way with a letter, which the psychic would read aloud so that she could hear. The message's ultimate purpose became clear at the end. There was a request for a substantial sum of money to be left at a designated location, along with a written response. The reason for the money was not specified, but it was suggested that Psychic had serious personal problems that could only be addressed with this financial aid. Rick's mind screamed that this was an obvious fraud. The intent was crystal clear. Someone was trying to extract money from a wealthy businessman, exploiting his love story. Of course, uncovering the specifics mentioned in the letter wouldn't be straightforward, but that didn't mean it was impossible, right? Rick was torn between his heart's desire and reason. He had never wanted anything more passionately than to believe that Carly had reached out to him from the other world. She had always been persistent, and although the sum of money was significant, it was affordable for him. After much deliberation, he decided to follow his heart. In response to the letter, Rick wrote a heartfelt message to his beloved, unbothered by the idea of a stranger reading it. He enclosed the requested money and left it in the agreed location. However, he included a bit of trickery suggested by his rational side. In his letter, he asked several deeply personal questions and, in certain parts, he intentionally misstated the facts. Details about their meetings, conversational topics, or who defended which stance in an argument. While this couldn't confirm the author's identity, it could potentially disprove it. Rick started visiting the designated drop-off location regularly. After a few days, the envelope with the letter and money disappeared. He was confident that the envelope had reached its intended recipient, given the location's obscurity. Rick eagerly waited for a response to his letter. He considered the possibility that, after receiving the payment, the self-proclaimed psychic might disappear. However, he also couldn't dismiss the chance of her returning, which he secretly hoped for. Regardless of whether it was a scam, he just wanted to continue receiving the hopeful letters. It took at least a month before the next message arrived. Rick started to think that perhaps nothing more would happen. Maybe the scam artist had achieved her goal and saw no reason to push her luck further. Or perhaps his trick with the questions in the letter had worked. However, one day he found another envelope in his mailbox, strikingly similar to the previous one. As before, the concierge claimed to have seen or heard nothing. But now, this didn't irritate Rick as much. He was more eager to dive into reading the letter. The letter didn't disappoint him. Carly confirmed that the money had been received and warmly thanked him for sending it. She also detected all the traps set in the message, answering all the questions accurately and pointing out the inconsistencies. She even scolded him for his lack of trust. This was what made him suspicious. Carly's challenging upbringing in an orphanage left an indelible mark on her, leading to a general sense of suspicion and mistrust. Suspicious was her second nature. However, she only let her guard down once when she met Rick. Therefore, given her nature, she likely wasn't surprised when he wanted to verify the authenticity of her letter. These letters 
each ending with a barely noticeable request for money, started to ask for larger amounts each time. This time, the letter ended with another unobtrusive request for some amount of money for the psychic, and this time the figure was even larger than last time. Despite Rick being able to afford it, he became increasingly uneasy. He resolved to uncover the sender's identity. Rick wrote another letter, enclosed the money, and took it to the specified place, this time quite different, at the opposite end of the city from the first. Just like the previous time, he hid the envelope and money well to ensure that only the intended recipient would find them. This was in the hands of not only the mysterious sender, but also Rick himself. After all, the one who gets the money will definitely be the person he is looking for. No one else would think to dig under the bushes, searching for the hidden hatch, surrounded by haphazardly strewn boards. Rick Main's worry was time. Previously, it took the letter writer several days to find the envelope. He couldn't really sit in ambush for three or four days in a row, without going anywhere, so as not to miss the right moment. Fortunately, it didn't come to that. The envelope was retrieved just a few hours after Rick had hidden it. A young woman, evidently worn by life, swiftly lifted the exact board under which the money was concealed. She took out the cash, counted it, and nodded to herself. Rick recognized her the moment she appeared at the other end of the street. Initially, he had doubts about the coincidence, but when she went to the place where the envelope was hidden, his doubts completely vanished. It was Natalie, Carly's friend from the orphanage, and she was clearly the one extorting money from Rick. Realizing she was about to leave, Rick decisively emerged from the bushes where he'd been hiding. Seeing him, Natalie turned pale. Rick worried she might run away or call for help, claiming she was being attacked or robbed. It would be difficult to explain to bystanders what was actually happening. But Natalie, whether from fear or surprise, appeared rooted to the spot, watching as the man she'd been trying to deceive approached her. Why all this charade with the letters? he asked directly. Rick, what a surprise, I didn't expect to see you. Natalie feigned innocence. I just decided to take a walk. Natalie, stop playing games, the man responded tiredly. We both know you wrote to me pretending to be Carly and asked for money. It's a low move, but perhaps forgivable depending on why you did it. I don't know what you're talking about, Natalie replied innocently, still clutching the envelope with the letter behind her back. Well, suit yourself. If you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to the police. I believe I have enough power to hold you until they arrive. They'll definitely find your fingerprints on that envelope you're trying to hide, and on the two I have at home. Additionally, I suspect you need the money for a certain purpose. It won't be difficult to find out if you've suddenly acquired the exact amount of money you didn't have before. Shall I go on? Damn you, you miserable rich man, Natalie suddenly shouted pressed against the wall by his deductions. It was your fault that Carly died. You were off on your business trips, not even bothering to worry about her illness. If you had been with her at that moment, you could have driven her to the hospital. And you thought it would be fitting to punish me with money for the death of my beloved woman? He coldly inquired. Natalie's words hit him hard. He had often contemplated his role in the events and blamed himself for what had transpired. Perhaps he should have exercised more caution during their phone conversations. He should have urged her to see a doctor when he heard her cough. Or he could have cut his business trip short and rushed to see Carly. And I decided that since you've been part of the loss of one of my loved ones, you could at least help prevent another one. Natalie's tone softened, sounding almost pitiful. In what way? he asked. I have a son, Nick, she sobbed. He's three years old and has a congenital heart defect. He needs constant treatment that is quite expensive. Ideally, he should have surgery so he can live a normal life in the future. Her husband provides no support, 
He's an alcoholic, but also a criminal. He never contributed to the family financially, and now he's in jail. I don't know how I ended up with such a man. But that's not important now. What's important is that Nick urgently needs money. That's when I thought of you. Carly shared many personal details about you with me. Please just try to understand the desperation of a mother about to lose her only child. I apologize if my actions upset you. I can understand your desperation. Rick sighed. What I don't understand is this charade with letters written in the name of a deceased person. Despite our differences, you could have approached me directly. How could I deny helping a sick child, especially knowing how much he meant to Carly? I don't know what came over me, Natalie admitted, pulling her hand from behind her back to reveal an envelope filled with money. Take this. I'll repay the money I've already spent, even if in small installments. Please don't go to the police. I understand if you do, but I'm pleading, not for myself, but for Nick. What will he do without me? No need. Rick resolutely pushed back her hand with the envelope. Take the money and use it to support your son. Tell me, how much money do you need in total? For surgery, rehabilitation, and whatever else there may be. I'll find it. We'll save your boy. Natalie wanted to say something, but a lump formed in her throat. She cried and threw herself on Rick's neck. Caught off guard, he awkwardly put one arm around her, unsure how to react. Eventually, she calmed down and pulled away from him. As promised, Rick covered all costs associated with Nick's treatment. Although he had to cut back on his certain things, it was manageable for him. Natalie's gratitude was immeasurable. However, Rick maintained a polite distance. Over time, their communication dwindled. They had saved Nick, but shared no other common interests. This whole story, of course, did not increase the warm feelings for Natalie in Rick's heart, and the woman, realising her guilt, tried not to impose. Rick continued to live his monotonous, colourless life after Carly's death. A miracle hadn't happened. He had lost all hope. Despite saving an innocent child, he didn't feel happy or proud. Months passed without any significant changes in Rick's life. He started to feel like he was slipping back into the same dreary routine he had been trying to escape for so long. He even bought a bottle of strong alcohol, but so far he had managed to resist opening it. However, he didn't know how long this restraint would last but soon life showed that his restraint didn't last long. One day he found himself sitting in the kitchen, staring at the teapot Carly had given him. He got up, took the bottle from the kitchen cupboard, and decisively poured some into a glass. Just as he was about to drink, he heard a strange rustling at the door, followed by a loud knock. He had to get up and answer it. "'Who's there?' he asked. "'Gas service!' they replied from behind the door. There's a leak somewhere in your building. We're checking all the apartments. Rick sighed. More than once he regretted choosing an apartment in a building that still used gas, constantly facing issues with it. This wasn't his first encounter with such a situation, so he opened the door without suspecting any foul play. His recollection of the subsequent events was hazy. Behind the door stood five or six men with a distinctly criminal appearance. Something flashed in the hand of the closest one, followed by a sharp pain in Rick's stomach, causing him to collapse on the ground, almost fainted. Stepping over him, the strangers entered the house. They hardly spent more than ten minutes there, which seemed an eternity to Rick. After taking all the valuable things they could carry, they approached him again. Rick felt another attack of pain. Someone must have kicked him with a heavy boot. He didn't know where he found the strength to grit his teeth and remain silent. The only thing clear to him was that his silence was the key to his survival. He needed the thugs to think he was dead. And then a sudden thought occurred in Rick's mind. Just fifteen minutes prior, he was indifferent about his own life. He had thought he wanted to die, but now he realised with clarity, no, I'm not ready for that. 
and clung desperately to life. I think he's dead, a gruff voice from above him said. That's great, let's get out of here, replied a second voice, which belonged to someone who referred to himself as the gas man. They left. Meanwhile, Rick laid on the floor, contemplating his next move. Unsure how much time had passed since he'd been wounded, he knew he had to reach a phone and call an ambulance. As he lost consciousness multiple times, he tried to make sense of his fragmented reality. He crawled. When he awoke, he was in a hospital. His stomach ached, but overall he felt much improved compared to when he'd been struggling to reach the phone. His effort must have been successful, considering he was still alive. The man attempted to pull himself up on the bunk for a better view, but was immediately met with sharp, piercing pain. Don't move, a quiet male voice commanded. You've survived a major surgery. Your life is no longer in danger, but you need time to recover. Please, no sudden movements. It will make our job much easier. Rick's vision cleared as the painful fog lifted. He noticed a man in a white coat standing in the doorway, likely a doctor. Did I call the ambulance? he asked, struggling to move his tongue. Yes, the doctor replied. Fortunately, you were strong enough to do so before losing consciousness. I think I lost consciousness earlier, Rick admitted weakly. I don't remember making the call. That's unsurprising given your condition, the doctor said. But the circumstances of this case are quite unusual. What do you mean? You see, something peculiar happened. A couple of hours after you were admitted, a man arrived. He looked like a gangster, the type you can identify just by their appearance. He persistently inquired about your condition, which was quite suspicious given your circumstances. But he insisted he wanted to assist you. Your condition was severe. You'd lost a lot of blood and needed a transfusion. But your blood type is very rare. It's impossible to obtain it quickly and in the required quantities. Simply put, we needed to find a donor. So I thought, what's there to lose? I informed the criminal, and he immediately offered to donate blood for you. I didn't believe it would work, but it turns out he has the same blood type. Moreover, it's perfectly compatible with yours, so much so that I can confidently say you could be related. That's ridiculous, Rick firmly retorted. I don't have any such relatives. Regardless, the doctor shook his head. You are alive today, solely thanks to this man. So may I meet my saviour, or did he leave without waiting to see the results of his good deed? Well, he specifically wanted to talk to you, especially after I mentioned your possible kinship. Unfortunately, he didn't have the time. He was arrested right here in the hospital about two hours ago. Most strikingly, it was concerning the robbery at your apartment. Rick groaned and closed his eyes. He didn't understand anything, but it was clear that the doctor wouldn't be able to answer his numerous questions. You need to rest said the doctor. Rest now, and I will come to see you in the evening. Rick didn't object. He could feel his strength fading and fell asleep almost immediately after the doctor closed the room's door. When he woke up, he found a person beside his bed whom he had never expected to see. Natalie was sitting on the chair next to him. Her face was even paler than when he had caught her holding the envelope. Noticing that he was awake, she smiled and asked, "'How are you feeling?' "'Fine,' Rick replied habitually, trying not to wrinkle his nose too much. "'There's something I have to tell you,' she said firmly, tears welling up in her eyes. "'All your troubles seem to arise because of me. First these letters, now this.' "'What do you mean?' Rick asked, confused. What does the robbery of my apartment have to do with you? It wasn't me, but it was my husband. But isn't he in jail? And as far as I know, he's supposed to be there for a long time. Yes, but he was released due to an amnesty around the time you and I stopped talking. He saw that Nick was healthy and was happy, 
but soon started questioning where the money was coming from. I told him about you. That's when he got angry. He refused to believe that you were helping us just out of kindness. He accused me of infidelity and said he'd take revenge. So, he's the one who stabbed me? No, he didn't. I spoke to him recently, after his re-arrest. It's true, he set these robbers on you and was part of a gang, but he didn't intend for you to be killed. He merely wanted to, as he put it, punish you. He wanted to hurt you financially, but the gang leader turned out to be a loose cannon, the kind that leaves no witnesses. Tucker couldn't intervene in time. All he could do was convince them that you were already dead, so they wouldn't harm you. And he also called an ambulance. Did he visit the hospital too? Yes, he did. He couldn't ignore his conscience. After all, you saved his son. So he decided to return the favour. He truly didn't want things to turn out this way. Rick was utterly confused. How could he and Natalie's husband be related? Almost like brothers. What could they possibly have in common? And what was he supposed to do now? If Tucker truly didn't intend to kill him, which seemed likely, it meant that Tucker's arrest was unjustified. Well, not entirely, but now they were charging him with a far more serious crime than he committed, and that was wholly wrong. Moreover, Rick felt a debt towards Tucker after all the man saved his life, and if Natalie's account was correct, he did so twice. Weary of these thoughts, Rick soon succumbed to sleep once more. It was clear that he couldn't do anything at that moment. His immediate focus had to be on recovery and leaving the hospital, and only then could he contemplate everything else. That's precisely what he did, aiming to recuperate as swiftly as possible. He didn't decline any medication and diligently adhered to all the doctor's instructions. His efforts paid off. Rick's health improved rapidly, allowing him to leave the hospital in two months, instead of the six initially predicted by the doctor. Upon his discharge, he first visited his parents. Carefully, he wanted to ask them if he possibly had a brother. Was he not their first child? Perhaps the family was in dire circumstances and they were forced to place their eldest son in an orphanage? However, his mother vehemently rejected this notion. We didn't have any children except you, she stated firmly. Our family has never been poor enough to resort to such extreme measures. We weren't rich, but we were never poor. Wait a minute, father interrupted suddenly. I have an idea. Both his wife and son stared at him in bewilderment. Was he about to confess to infidelity? No, that couldn't be. Granted, Rick couldn't entirely rule out such a possibility, but it wasn't something to discuss with his mother. A long time ago, even before I met your mother, I had a bride. The father continued. However, she broke up with me because I was too simple for her, and she wanted to live in the city. Who knows, she might have left me being pregnant. I don't know if this could be true, but I have no other guesses. That was all Rick needed to know. The story seemed believable, but whether it was true or not could be resolved later. For now, his priority was to rescue his Tucker from the predicament. Rick believed Tucker hadn't acted out of malice, but out of folly, and life had been tough for him. Rick hired a well-known lawyer for Tucker, and it paid off. Tucker confessed to his involvement in the recent robbery. The court considered his lack of intent to kill, and his efforts to make amends for the damage caused. Despite his criminal history, Tucker received a suspended sentence, while the rest of the culprits received lengthy prison sentences without the possibility of parole. Rick was pleased with the outcome. When they left the courtroom, Rick told Tucker, Stop messing around. You have a wife who loves you despite everything, and a child who needs a present father, not one who's always in trouble. Yeah, you're right, bro, but what other life do I know? Where would I go? A janitor, a loader. How could I support my family on that salary? 
That's if they'll hire me at all, considering my past. Let's make you my assistant. My business is expanding and it's becoming increasingly difficult to manage it alone every year. I haven't had an opportunity to look for a reliable partner. But remember, I'll be watching. If you revert to your old ways, I won't help you again. But I don't know anything about your business, Tucker responded desperately. That's not a problem as long as you're willing to learn. I'll pay for your courses and I'll teach you myself. All right, agreed Tucker. I promise no more crime. His promise may have sounded overly dramatic, but Tucker kept his word. He studied diligently, heeded Rick's advice, and soon became deeply involved in the company's operations. As a result, the company began to grow at a much faster rate, which delighted its owner. As for Natalie, Rick was right. She truly loved her husband, despite his past, and was overjoyed that he had finally decided to turn his life around. Soon, they moved into a larger apartment and enrolled Nick in a good kindergarten. Their family, having overcome all obstacles, became strong and happy. Once, they visited Tucker's mother, and she revealed that Rick's father had been right in his assumptions. Yes, I was foolish and naive. I was seduced by the artificial glitter of the city. Life punished me, and I realized that not all that glitters is gold. Forgive me, son. I understand, Tucker replied. Regardless, you gave me everything you could. You will always be my beloved mother. This changes nothing. Rick was happy for his brother, yet a bit envious. He himself had no family or children of his own, only the memory of a deceased bride. However, lately, he had started to move on. He felt that while he still had a tender, and sad affection for Carly, he was ready for a new relationship. But with whom? He didn't have much time to ponder that. Rick was engrossed with the business, which demanded more of his attention as it grew. He and his stepbrother had decided to open a new branch, and he was now busily seeking suitable employees. Rick handpicked each new hire, from top managers to the cleaning staff. However, he faced significant problems when it came to hiring a cleaner. Rick understood that the position was not prestigious, but he did not anticipate the absolute lack of interest in it. Despite offering a decent salary for the role, only one candidate applied during the two-month vacancy period. She was a girl from a dysfunctional family with no education or aspirations, and she was very happy about getting this job. Apparently, she had already given up hope of finding any way to make money for herself, and here was such unexpected luck. Rick felt guilty a little, because he initially felt some sort of prejudice against her. The thing that stressed him out the most was that the new cleaner's name was her dead fiancé. One day, in the middle of the workday, this cleaner walked into his office looking distressed. "'I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's urgent,' she stated confidently. Come in? Please, believe me, but your business is at risk. I overheard the managers talking. I promise I wasn't snooping intentionally. It's just that, well, people often overlook the cleaners. They're trying to take your business away from you. They're using your upcoming negotiations with the key client. I don't know much about business, but as soon as I realised something was amiss, I started recording. I'll send you the recording via messenger. Please listen to it as soon as you can. Having said this tirade, Carly hurriedly left the office, pulling out her phone on the way. Shortly after, Rick heard the notification of the message, but he remained still. He sat there, thinking about how much this Carly reminded him of his beloved Carly, especially in this critical situation. The information from the cleaning lady proved to be both true and invaluable. It was only after hearing the recorded conversation that Rick understood the planned setup and managed to prevent significant losses. Following intense negotiations, from which he emerged victorious, Rick realised that this woman had saved his business. He realised that she reminded him of Carly from the start, which was why he had been hesitant to hire her. 
He feared the associations and the inevitable loss when she would quit, having found a more suitable place. However, all his fears dissipated now. A week later, he asked Carly on a date. To his delight, she accepted. The date went even better than his wildest dreams. This led to more dates, and a year later, they were married. A few months after that, Carly announced to a thrilled Rick that they were expecting a child. <laughs>